Imagine that. We've been in chapter 11 for a long time. I promise you we're going to wrap it up tonight. Chapter 11. Robin said, oh, we're done with Hebrews. I said, no, we're done. We're going to be done with chapter 11. <laughs> There's two more chapters. I love the back of the book of Hebrews. I mean, to me, it just gets better and better and better as, as you close out. I mean, getting started in Hebrews is tough sledding unless you really know your Old Testament and you know all the sacrificial system and you know all about the laws and the covenant and you know all about the priesthood and you know all about the tabernacle. If you don't, you kind of get lost in it and it gets dry. If you know that, you can plug it in and say, okay, I see that and I see how Jesus fulfilled all this. But you get to the back, it gets real practical and as I shared a couple weeks ago, you take all of that and you say, and this is why Jesus is better. He is supreme. He is over all of that. And then you plug it into this is how, this is how we live it, and that's where we are. Uh, it's not just knowing about Jesus, but it's living it. And that's where we are in Hebrews chapter 11. So let's pray about this. Father, we thank you for Bible study night. It's a time... For us to just step away from the busyness of the week and chores about the house and trip to the store, whatever. Lord, when we can just spend time with you. Bless everyone that's came tonight. I pray that uh, their Bible will become a little more richer tonight, a little more fuller and a little more understandable and, and Father, a whole lot more alive. Lord, for all of us, and myself included, the Lord, breathe into the Word of God the breath of life. Fathers, you breathe in, in, in prophecy on them, dry bones, and they came back to life. Father, breathe in us. Bring us to life. And Father, a, a life full of faith that where God can do all things well. So Father, get a hold of us tonight in this Scripture and use it to minister to us in a deep way. Be with those who couldn't be here tonight. I pray for young and old, doesn't matter, Father, wherever they are, whatever's going on in their life, Lord, would you minister unto them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We, as I have said, have spent a lot of time in chapter 4. This is week 4. Hasn't been four consecutive Wednesdays, but all total, we've been in this chapter four weeks. But there's a, lo there's a long list of names here that I didn't want to just run through. And, but I wanted to just throw out the anchor and spend some time here with some of the more pertinent ones and say, but what happened in their life that shed, sheds light on us on what faith meant to them and what it should mean to us? These glowing examples, stories that we learned as children, Stories that captivate our hearts and minds even yet today, and stories that propel us to an even deeper faith. But all of these stories in chapter 11 have something in common. Can you, can you cook it down and help us in our study? What is something that is, uh, it's not just the word faith, but there's something about the stories of their life that they, that's the common denominator for them all. Now, I know you got up that this morning Obedience. with that burning on your mind. And you just... Obedience. Obedience. Faith in action. Faith in action. It's true. But there's something else. Deeper. Hmm. Their commitment, they didn't... Give in to pressure. You're getting warmer. Mm -hmm. Had faith. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Belief. All of them went through some of the most difficult trials of life. That's what I was looking for. Yes, they were obedient in the worst of times, but all of these stories that you're looking at, this long list in chapter 11, 
every one of them had dark, dark chapters in their life and uh, difficulties, and not a one of them tucked and run. Well, Abraham did for a little bit in Egypt, and Isaac wanted to. God said, no, don't you do that. Uh, learn from your daddy. But Abel was the first martyr. Think about that. The first martyr. And who killed Abel? Okay. His own. You're talking about dysfunction. The very first family. And it, 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 <laughs> dysfunctional. And then you have the first murder, martyred over his faith because he was jealous over his sacrifice. Enoch lived in a dark period. And Enoch prophesied, we're, we're getting close to the days of the flood, and, and God took him, but he wrote, Jude said, and prophesied, and warned people that were ungodly about ungodly times, and, and all that ungodliness, and warned them in the darkest of days. Noah. How many, how many people got on, uh, on, got on the boat? Eight, eight. eight people out of the whole world. Eight people got on the boat. Now you talk about dark, hard times, and preach righteousness and holiness for a hundred years while that ark was being built, and not one convert. He's lucky to get his own family on. Think about that. Abraham, God pushed him and tested him and and tried him by fire on the mountain with his son Isaac and, and then with uh, rescuing Lot. And, <laughs> and then waiting to have a, a baby and praying and trusting God to walk in faith and God gave him a promise, I'm going to do this. And, then, and it's like the promise never came around. 25 years waiting on the promise. Isaac raised two boys. And here we go again with dysfunction. How did them boys get along? Like brothers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, oil and water, there they are. And, and in one day's time, he just about lost them both, didn't he? Jacob steals the blessing. Well, he'd already stole the birthright, but he goes in and, and connives and steals the blessing. And Esau says, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. And, and Mama has to intervene and get him to, off to, to Laban's or Esau will kill him. And then Esau will get married and move off and leave. And there's, there's Mom and Dad with an empty nest and for years. And Jacob's not even in the picture. For 20 years, he's, he's not even, no letters, no phone calls, no Mother's Day cards, no Christmas cards. They, crickets for 20 years. And when he comes home, his dad's still alive. When he left, you would, you would assume that Isaac is on his deathbed. I mean, he can't, he can't even tell his own sons apart. He can smell Isaac's arms and, and, and the skins and thinks it's Esau, but you'd think the man is on his deathbed. Jacob goes to Laban's, and he comes back 20 years later, and his dad is still alive. I, 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 in my mind, the man's a vegetable by now. Jacob. Strife. Years with Laban, loss of Joseph. He lived with that lie that his sons lied to him and said that, that Joseph was dead and tormented that poor man for years. And then he and ends up in Egypt, and that's not even the promised land, and handed down from, from his grandfather and his dad that this is the promised land, and now he's in Egypt. And uh, he says, don't you dare bury me here. Joseph, betrayed by the family. Moses, you get down to Moses. And man, Moses saw some dark times, didn't he? He had to run for his life out of Egypt. And for 40 years, he's a shepherd on the backside of Sinai. Sinai. And then, you know, getting the, the Israelites out of Egypt was no picnic, was it? And, and getting them to believe him and getting Pharaoh to believe him and 
and and God's having to coach him all, all along the way. And 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 he said, I didn't birth these people. They ain't my kids. God says, you can do it. Come on. Come on, Moses. Don't quit. And then wandering in the wilderness with them for 40 years. You talk about tough times. Every one of these people, they went through some hard knocks. That's that's the one thing that I, when I read this, I'm, they're not just superheroes and can leap tall buildings with a single bound and stop speeding bullets and locomotives. and They're, they're like you and me. They get tired, they get weary, they get hungry. They cry, they hurt, they bleed. These are real people that went through some of the worst times. And like Dale said, they did not run. They were obedient to the faith. Chapter 11, verse 39 says, All these, having obtained a good report through faith, but not a one of them had received the promise. Not a one of them. Not a one of them lived to see Jesus. That's the promise. They, they did not see the Messiah. They had that hope. They had that dream. They had that promise. But, but all of them will die before it ever happens. And, and, and they will die believing. There will be a Messiah. There will be an answer. There will be better days. There will be the kingdom of God. It, it's going to happen. Not a one of them lived to see. Well, we are going to look at two verses in this chapter. Verse 30 and verse 31. I wanted to tarry with one more individual in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. And her name is Rahab. Verse 30 says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. Verse 31, By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with what? Peace. With peace. Two verses to that whole story that's in Joshua Chapter 2 through chapter 6. Uh, there's two verses. The walls came down. Rahab and her family are saved. I always want to tarry here for a while because I want us to be reminded of the power of God to vanquish evil and the power of God to save to the absolute uttermost. Two things that probably I need to hear right now in this day and age, is that God can overcome wickedness and evil. And number two, that he can save to the uttermost. I, I, I need to know that. I need to believe that. I can't, I can't watch the news without believing that God can change things or that he's in control. I, I need to know that he is still all-powerful. So this lesson maybe tonight may just be for Mark. So I don't know, but uh, here we go. We uh, have hopscotched past the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, and uh, you've, you've already transitioned of power from Moses to Joshua. This is the first real test for the Israelite army coming in to the promised land, and the two and a half tribes have promised that they will uh, fight with the rest of them. And so you have the combined army total and the first city that they will deal with is Jericho. What do you know about Jericho? Just off the top of your head. Had a great wall. Had a great wall. Long before China did. What else do you know about Jericho? Joshua marched around those walls seven times. Yeah. But as far as the city itself, you know what it's called? It's called the City of Palms. You know why? It's like an oasis. There is a there is a flood of water there. It is a green spot 
in a big brown area. And to this day, water flows there. And it, it, they have irrigated the land around there. And some of the best citrus ever grown in the world comes out of Jericho. You ever go to Israel, uh, Colby will tell you, when you get to Jericho, make sure you load up on citrus. <laughs> they, they've, got a, they've got oranges, and then they've got something that is a cross between an orange and a grapefruit that is fantastic. Don't ask me how to pronounce it or say it, because I don't remember anymore. But it, it's got a rind about that thick, and you have to cut the rind. But once you get into it there, it's, it's, it's awesome. And it only grows in only grows in Jericho and one other place in the world. Mm -hmm. I don't remember where, but oh, it's awesome. But the, the, it's, Greg is right. It, it, it's an invincible city. There's these walls that are impenetrable. Plenty of food, lots of water. They they can they can hold out for a long time, and they, they could be attacked and never worry about anything. Let me read to you uh, this an old book, All the Women of the World by Edith Dean, in that series of all the of the Bible, you know, all the poems or all the promises or all the prayers or all the you know, sermons or you know, that whole series. Let me read you this. Built over the gap between two walls of Jericho was the house of a woman identified in both the Old and New Testament as Rahab the Harlot. This ancient city, city of palms it is known, was surrounded by two walls. According to recent archaeological findings, there's a space of 12 to 15 feet between the two walls. Houses of sun-dried brick were built over the gap between the two walls and supported by timbers laid from one wall to the other or by small cross walls of brick. Rahab's house was in one of these strategic points and her window looked out of the outer wall. There's two walls. There's the outer wall, then the inner wall, and there were houses that would be built on top of those, supported by the two walls. Pretty incredible. If you go to Joshua chapter 2, we're going to jump into the story. <clears throat> Joshua sends two men over there as spies to check out as much as they can and get good intel on the city and come back with a report. They end up at Rahab's house. And her story is here in front of us. She's not a perfect person. But she's a woman of faith. And by the time we get to her in the story, here's what you need to understand. She's already a believer in the Hebrew God. Before, they don't evangelize her. She's already a believer. She may be one of the few in Jericho that already believes, but that's in the story. We'll, we'll cover that. She already believes in the Hebrew God. Chapter 2. Who is just itching to read? I mean, you're, you've got a burning fire in your bones. You, you want to read. Thank you, Rhonda. Huh? <laughs> and if you would read chapter 2 and chapter 3. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yes, I am kidding you. Uh, this is such a great story. I can't just hopscotch and hit a few. We just got to read the whole thing. Four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Let's everybody read one verse. We'll start with Dale. And yeah, if you don't want to, and if you don't want to read your verse, you just punch that person beside you, and they'll pick up with your verse. You know, if you don't, if you don't want to read, but it's Joshua chapter two, Joshua chapter two, and we're going to start with verse one, and we'll read down. Uh, well, there's 16 of us. So let's read 17 verses. Dale, would you start with verse 1, and then Rhonda verse 2, 
And Nancy, verse 3. I'll read verse 4. Robin, read verse 5. Mary, read verse 6. And you, you read them out loud. Everybody read one verse. And if you don't want to read, just poke somebody. We'll keep going. Dale. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Mm -hmm. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, Look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the country. I'm in verse 4. And the woman took the two men and hid them, and said thus, there came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. And it came to pass about the time of the shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Whether the men went, I won't not pursue after them quickly, for ye overtake them. But she brought them up to the roof of the house, and hid them with the stalks of flax which she laid in order on the roof. Okay. Verse 7. Seven. Seven. Yeah. Seven. Mm -hmm. and, the men and the men pursued them by the road to the Jordan, to the fords. And as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. Verse 8. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof. And she said unto them, <coughs> The men know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon her, and that all the inhabitants of the land thank because of you. For we have heard that the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. When ye came out of Egypt, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Shion and all, whom um, utterly destroyed. When, when we heard of it, our hearts melted, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Now therefore, I pray you swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house, and give me a true token. And that ye will save alive my father, and my mother, and my brother, and my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. So the men answered her, Our lives for yours, if none of you tell this business of ours, and it shall be when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with you. So she let them down by a rope through the window from the house she lived in was part of the city wall. She said to them, Go to the hills, so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourself there three days until they return, and then go on your way. Dale, you're blessed. You get to read verse 17. Now the men had said to her, This oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land you have tied the scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down, and unless you have brought your father and mother your brothers and all your family into your house. Okay. <coughs> Why do you think Rahab felt led to give these spies a place to hide? What was it? She had seen what God had done for their people. Or she, heard, feared the Lord. 
She feared the Lord. She's not seen. She's heard stories. She's not seen any. She lives in Jericho. You know, that's a long ways off from the Red Sea. She's heard the stories. She's not seen. But something's happened in this woman's heart. Something. Because Greg's verse, look at the end of verse 11. The Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. These are pagan people. Jericho is not a Christian city. They don't have uh, TBN broadcasting. They don't have Christian radio. This is pagan people. And here's a woman living in Jericho, but she believes. She's heard the story. She's heard the account of how God opened the Red Sea and how God defeated these two kings through the Israelites and how it seems like nothing can stop them, how God fed them in the wilderness. He'd never fed anybody like that. They'd be out there in the wilderness. They starved to death. They'd dry up in no water. God gave them water. They've heard the stories. People, nomads have passed them and saw what was going on. And How do these people, what are they? They're not growing crops. How is it possible that they are surviving 40 years in the wilderness? She's heard. And verse 11 here is her testimony. And these two spies are not evangelizing her. She does this on her own. She says from her own heart, as Brian said, the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. There ain't anybody else left in that area that believes in one God. They had many gods. They had a God for rain and God for sunshine and for fertility and for children and they had a God for everything. She says, your God is the God, one God. What would have happened if she would have been found out that she was hiding the spies? She, she and her family would have been killed. would have killed all the she had. And not just her, but her whole, family. her whole family would have been wiped out. You see that in the Old Testament. I mean, when like Achan, I mean, it, it wasn't just Achan's sin. It was the whole kit and caboodle. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar and others, we, you know, if one, it's the whole family suffers. So, you know, there's a lot riding on this with her. What does she give the spies more than just Safety. Directions to go. She gives them a plan, doesn't yeah. she? And she gives them directions. And tells them to stay three days. Don't move from there. She knows enough about the movements of the king's guard to know what their routine is. There's that business of stay three days. She knows what the routine is. She she knows what protocol is of what. When scouts go out, what, what they can expect, how long they'll be out before they come back, stay three days. That, that's important. After three days, you're safe. It's important that they knew that. What else does she provide them with? Didn't when the king's men come looking for them, she sent them in the wrong direction? Yeah, they went that, that way. way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she lied, didn't she? I don't know how you feel about that. Uh, some people get really bent out of shape because she lied. She she lied. What was what were the lies that she told? That she hadn't seen them. Uh, uh, she what man? I haven't seen what them. man? They were like nobody. <laughs> I haven't had any visitors all night. She what? didn't just come out and lie about her. <laughs> yeah. No, I haven't seen them. Don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, but this is a time of war. And in war, sometimes we tell things to throw the enemy off to uh, win the war. And it's all about espionage, but uh, some people get bent out of shape. God honored that. You know, the old question is, if, if you were hiding Jews back in the war, and they knocked on your door and they said, is there any Jews in this house? You know, you'd say, Lord, I hope I don't have to tell a lie, but 
there was a lot of people that said, no, there's no Jews here, in order to save their life. And God honored that. You're, God knows our heart, doesn't he? He knows why, why we say things and what we do. What was the prevailing mindset in Jericho about Israel? What was the prevailing mindset of all the people, and even the king? Weren't they scared of them? Now look at verse 9. She said, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us. They were afraid. They were behind very large walls, but they were afraid that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. They were terrified. Fear of God was on them. That's a good thing. Well, she told them in 10, too, said she, they'd heard how the Lord dried up, you know, the water. Yeah. The Red sea. And, and Pharaoh's army was defeated. I mean, who could take on Pharaoh's army? I mean, can you imagine them telling the Red Sea, you know, was straight up? <laughs> I mean, that had to be God. I mean, she knew that that had to be God. What was the king and his cabinet of Jericho trusting in? The walls. His walls. Those walls are going to be their Achilles heel, aren't they? You know, and anything that you trust in other than God will always come back to haunt you. You know, I don't care what it is. If you put all your faith in this and not God, God can make it crumble. It doesn't matter what it is. What was Rahab's request of the spies? To save her and her family and all, all the world. Verse 12 and 13, I want you, I want protection. Witness protection plan here. I want my, me, my whole family, all of us. How much faith did it trust for this woman to trust two total strangers? She's never met them before. She's never seen their face on a billboard. She's never heard them on the radio. She doesn't know these people from Adam. Never met them before in her life. She welcomes them into her home. She hides them. And she's trusting her life because if she's found out and she almost got caught because somebody snitched and said the spies are at her house and there's a knock at the door. What are the terms between her and the spies? You save us, we'll save you. That's what they told her, our life for your life. You gave us safety, refuge, we will give you safety and refuge. What were their terms? What did they tell her? Tie that ribbon. To tie that <coughs> a ribbon by the window. Where they In the window. Know, where they would know where she was at, I would suppose. What else? Bring all the family into that. Everybody had to be in that room. They couldn't leave. And you, they, when, when the attack happens, they have to be in one spot. That's their go-to spot. What else? Don't tell no one. You could not breathe one word of it, because if you tell and it's out, deal's off. Deal's off. You, if you broadcast this, it's over. Get it. Deal's off. Now, what, what is unique about this cord? It's red, like blood red. Jesus' blood. It's scarlet. And, and, and it's a little bit in verse 18. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt find this line of scarlet thread in the window that thou didst let us down by. The King James says scarlet thread but then it says that we went down the wall with. They were not, they were not let down by a thread. Okay? They were let down by a rope. 
So it's a rope that she hangs in the window. That's scar the very same rope that the spies escaped and she put out the window and they climbed down the wall with. That same rope is what she's to have in the window that will mark her house and uh, they will know that when, when the army comes, that's what they're to look for. Chapter 5, verse 5, verse 13, Joshua and the army is ready to uh, approach Jericho, and I love this passage. I'm going to read this. It came to pass, I'm in mean, chapter 5, verse 13. It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with a sword drawn in his hand, and Joshua went to him. And he said, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? In other words, whose side are you on? You on our side or their side? And the angel says, No, but as captain of the Lord of hosts, am I now come? So whose side is he on? God's side. He's on God's side. <laughs> and Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said to him, what saith my Lord to his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Loose your sh Take your shoes off, if I could paraphrase, for where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Who, who is he talking to? Captain of the Lord of hosts. Some would say this is Michael the archangel. Normally, Michael is over all the angels. Michael. Gabriel is uh, used as a messenger for the salvation of Israel. But Michael's the warrior. But the fact here that Joshua worships and this being doesn't stop him. Jesus. Because normally if you, angels say, no, 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 you can't do that. I mean, I'm, <laughs> worship God. He is not stopped. This lets me think perhaps this is Jesus. Uh, uh, an Old Testament moment where Jesus there appears. I, I love that. So you've got the confirmation of the woman, Rahab, that says to the spies, the whole, the whole city is scared to death. We're, we're on pins and needles because the, your army's over here and we're scared to death. We've heard all the stories. When they came back in uh, at the end of chapter 2, they, verse 23 and 24, they descended from the mountain, passed over, they came to Joshua, and they told everything that befell him. In verse 24, chapter 2, they said, Truly the Lord has delivered into our hands all the land, and even all the inhabitants of the country do faint because of us. So that was a shot in the arm for Joshua. I mean, to know that the fear of God was already on all the inhabitants of Jericho, and then they're getting ready to go in, and hit, now he meets this messenger. Wow. You talk about an adrenaline rush, and you think, yes, we got this. Chapter 6. Jericho was straightly sh shut up because of the children of Israel. None went in and none come out. I mean, they're in lockdown. I think that nobody can see that rope in Rahab's window because her window faces the outside wall. If nobody's coming in, nobody's going out, nobody can see that rope hanging there. Okay? Only the Israelite army can see it because they're on the outside coming. They can see the rope. Nobody in the city can see it. The Lord said unto Joshua, See, I've given unto thine hand, in verse 2, Jer Jericho and all the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. And if you can pass the city, all you men of war, and go round about the city once, thus shall you do it for six days. Seven priests shall bear before the ark, seven trumpets of ram, ram sword, seventh day shall you can pass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets, and shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall do what? Collapse. And the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said unto them, Take up the ark of the covenant. Let the seven priests bear the seven trumpets of ram's horns. 
before the ark of the covenant, ark of the Lord. And he said unto the people, Pass on, come past the city. Let him that is armed pass on before the ark. And it came to pass when Joshua had spoken unto the people, that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets and the ram's horns passed on before the Lord and blew with the trumpet and the ark of the covenant and the Lord followed them. And the armed men went before the priests that blew with the trumpets and a re-reward came after the ark, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And Joshua commanded the people saying, Ye shall not shout nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout. Then shall ye shout. So the ark of the Lord can pass the city going about at once. And it came under the camp and lodged there. Well, the story goes on. They do that every day. Verse 14, the second day they come past the city once and returned to the camp. So they did six days. Verse 15, but on the seventh day, what did they do? Didn't hear you. Got up early. They got up early, and how many times did they go around Jericho? Seven. Seven. Seven times. And when the trumpets blowed, what did the people do? Shout. They shouted, and when they shouted, what happened? The walls came tumbling down. Did you know that archaeologists have, have done enough digs there that they have said that that's exactly what they find? The walls did not fall out. The walls did not fall in. The walls came down just like you were blowing up a building, imploding it. You've seen that on, on YouTubes or on the news where they bring down a stadium or a building and they put uh, detonators in it and they just they bring it down. That's exactly what happened with those walls. They've, they've unearthed that and said... Yep, there it was. Your Bible's true. That's how it happened. There's a song like that. Joshua at the Battle of Jericho. And yeah. the wall came from <laughs> down. Yeah. Well, how did they know where Rahab was? What, just well, that's a good question. If the walls came down, how did her house stay up there? Yeah. <laughs> because she was between the her walls. Her house, yeah. If... Hers wasn't on the wood. Hers were on the lid of walls. Yeah, but the walls came down. Not hers. <laughs> I think it is, is, it's the God symbol. The rope was there to locate. Also, the whole family had to be in the same room. There's That's one spot that did not. There's, there's several ideas here. It's possible that when they were going around that city, there were people that went to her spot because there's nobody coming in and nobody going out went to the wall and they came down and escaped while they were marching around the city. Mm. Or all the walls came down except where her house was. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it happened. I wasn't there. <laughs> so so the Bible says they all collapsed. So either God got around early, kind of like he got Noah in the ark, and then the water came. Thank God got her out as they were marching around, and all the city scared to death what's going to happen. That that's in that moment when everybody's panicking inside the city, that that they knew to go to that house because that's where the cord was, and got them out. I don't know. What about verse 22? Verse 22 says, but Joshua had said unto the two men that had spied out, Go into the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman and all that she had, as you swear unto her. That they they couldn't get into the city, they had to go to where the building was. They said, Jump. <laughs> we'll catch you. I'd say they used the rope to get down. It was good enough for the spies, it'd be good enough for her and the family. I don't know how God did it, but God did it. You make up your own mind. Who, who, made, who come up with the battle plans for Jericho? God. 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 It, it, this is not jo Joshua's plan, is it? This is God's plan. What was the purpose of the trumpets? Mm -hmm. It would cause confusion. Confusion, scare them. some that it was part of the it's part of God's plan 
<laughs> to vibrate. When he returns, it'll come on trumpet call. You remember Gideon? They blew the, everybody busted their pitchers and blew the horn. There, there's something about God and, his, and trumpets. Uh, there's a lot of history here with the shofar that uh, it's implemented. There was a battle cry that when the trumpet sounded, that if it was a certain sound, the men knew to go to war. They could, they could blow that trumpet and, and it wasn't some uncertain sound. They knew if, how many short blasts was a call to come to the tabernacle or a call to go to war. What's the purpose of everybody being quiet? Nobody could talk until it was time to talk. Sneaking up on them? No. <laughs> nobody, nobody, they they nobody, there. nobody's allowed to talk for seven days. You can, every time they went around the city, everybody in total silence. You couldn't talk to your neighbor. Silence at my house means somebody's mad. <laughs> It would be a sign of obedience, and it would also be respect for what the Lord's going to do, and it would be a worshipful time. They would be contemplating what God was going to do and anticipating. They've seen all these other miracles, so they would be anticipating what was going to happen. And Them or the people in Jericho. And yeah. would they be playing mind games because they're saying, well, who are these crazy people just marching around, marching around, marching around? And they would do it one day and then they go and back they, to their camp. And nothing, no and tomorrow sense. morning they come out and they do it again and, and it, nobody says a word. Well, and it kept them from, from speaking and letting them know who they were. They, they would reveal themselves possibly had they spoken. I think it also, it's all of it, but I think it also kept them from speaking fear. God says, yeah, I don't want you to say anything because somebody would have been grumbling and complaining. My feet hurt. <laughs> <laughs> this is stupid. <laughs> this don't sound like much of a battle plan to me. <laughs> Who have you, who's, ever, who's ever heard of this? Pharaoh's army never did this. Why, why are we doing this? I, I, it would have been, it, if they would have talked, it would, I know the Jews, you know the Jews, they'd been complaining, murmuring. They sure did it with Moses, they would have been murmuring with Joshua. God says, N you're not going to be able to say anything. Mm -hmm. If you can't praise me and worship, then you just be quiet. Mm -hmm. And when I say shout, you can shout then. But, but for, you just be quiet. This army is so big, and I meant to look this up, and I didn't. This, if you go back and you look at how many fighting men for each tribe, this army going around Jericho, I think, would have completely encircled the whole city. You're talking about a huge, huge army. You're talking about some of them tribes had 40,000, 50,000 men per tribe. You got 12 tribes. You know, and it's not just the nine and a half tribes, the two and a half tribes from the other side of Jordan. They're with them. This is the first battle. I think there is enough soldiers that, that and, and they're walking, how many, how many abreast, who knows? And they're going all the way around the city. And I think they're out far enough away that no archer can hit them. But even still, it didn't come, I think that when they all get in formation and walk, it, it, they, they're completely surrounding the city. And so when the walls fall, there's not one opening for anybody to run out. Mm -hmm. They are completely surrounded. It is huge. When those walls fall, it's such a miracle because in my Bible it was saying that some places the walls were 20 feet high and 20 feet thick. Yeah. So that was just a miracle. Back to Hebrews 11. In chapter 23, or in verse 23, it says, And the young men that were spies went in and brought out Rahab. So she must have been in that mess somewhere, but God had... It's possible she threw the rope down and they crawled up and said, Okay, who's here? You're with us and got them out. I, 
the city is closed up. Nobody's coming in. Nobody's going out. I know what my Bible says the same thing. They went in. If they went in, she had to drop the rope and they climbed up. I, 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 I don't know. It's, it's probably all of the above. It says 601,000 probably fighting men. That's a lot. It's, it's a lot of infantry. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 11, and I'm out of time. Hebrews 11, back where we started. By faith, what happened? Verse 30. Walk by faith. No heavy artillery. No RPGs. No explosives. No F-16s. By faith. And faith alone, the walls came down. By faith, the next verse, Rahab is saved and all her family. Two verses. It took faith for the Israelites to do this. It took a lot of faith to say, we're going to march around this city. And God will never tell them to do that ever again. And all those cities that they will attack throughout Israel, he'll never use this battle plan ever again. This is a one-time deal. But he just uses it at Jericho. By faith. It happened. The next verse says, by faith, Rahab is saved. Mm -hmm. The whole story is all about, she had to have faith, and trust these strangers, they had to have faith that she won't out them. They had to have faith that she wouldn't tell everybody what's happening. The whole story is about faith in God. And that's what this whole chapter is all about. Well, God had a purpose for sending them around there seven times, for I mean, seven days. So the earth had to be vibrating. If not, then with that many people continually going around. Thump, 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 thump. I mean, it would have. It would have had to vibrate. Yeah. You know. Windows rattling. Now, cut to the chase. What do you know? What's the rest of the story about Rahab? Jesus come down. They, she stayed with the Israelites. Right. They they took her into the camp. She is put outside. Her and the family put outside the camp because they're Gentiles and there's a period of time where they they're unclean. They they go through ceremonies. They will become part of uh, the clan. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. What do you know it's in chapter 1 of Matthew? The lineage going to Jesus. Yeah, yeah, you've got uh, all you genealogy buffs. <laughs> Matthew chapter 1, we'll close with this. Verse 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas, and his brethren, and Judas begat Phares, and Zerah of Tamar, and Phares begat Eskram, and Eskram begat Aram, and Aram begat Abinadab, and Abinadab begat Naosin, and Naosin begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz of who? Rahab. Rahab. There she is. Yep. So why did she have to stay out of the camp if she was considered a Gentile? They did that. They were unclean as Gentiles. And Jews back then, you could not, become... Is that not a Jew, though? If she's not in the line? No, she is not a Jew. She's a Gentile. But she married in. But she marries in. She marries a Jew. Some... Jewish historian says she marries Joshua, but if you look at Matthew uh, chapter 1, verse 5, she's connected with Salmon, and her and Salmon have a son by the name of Boaz. Boaz will have a son named Obed by Ruth, yeah. and Obed has a son by the name of Jesse, and Jesse has a whole bunch of boys. And who is the youngest? 
David. The youngest is David. So Rahab is in the bloodline of Jesus. Now, 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 now uh, if if uh, you can swallow that, there it is. Was she converted? Yeah, she became a Jew. The, the Jews would allow proselytes. You could you could convert and become a Jew. Ruth became a Jew. Yeah. Even though she was a Mo Moabitess, she became a Jew. But she had faith, didn't she? She had faith to believe. When 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 they when they got there, she welcomed them into her house. She hid them. She gave them protection. She covered for them. She gave them good advice and counsel. God works through people we would tend to reject. Right. Have you, you noticed that? <laughs> yeah, she was a shady lady. <laughs> God used her. Yeah. But it took faith on everybody in the whole story. The whole story is about faith. Faith, her, she had to have faith. And her family had to have faith, and she had faith, and, and that what she's, she's telling them is, because they all had to huddle together, they all had to keep this secret, nobody in the family could share it. And, and who, can, who can imagine the terror that was in their heart when the Israelites were marching around Jericho, and that family, for fear, what could happen, even at the last minute, were found out, and yet God protected them. Great story. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the promises of God. We thank you, Lord, that you've opened the door to whosoever will. Believe on you. Trust you. Father, help us to believe. Saving to the uttermost. That, Father, you can put down evil. And you can get the victory. Pray that you'll do that in our life and that we will trust you even, Lord, when it seems impossible, even, Lord, when it seems that, Lord, there is no way. We, we know with you there is always a way. So, Father, may we walk in that by faith. We pray that in the name of Jesus. Go with us as we go home. Keep us safe on the road. May your mercy and grace and peace be over us all. We pray that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here tonight. God bless you all.